Um, Dr. Harris from Michigan Medicine um, has already, like I said, given us a presentation for tab, TABR values. And so now we're going to look at um, echo values for mitral procedures. And Dr. Harris, if you remember, he's from Michigan Medicine, part of their structural heart um, team. He um, is a cardiovascular disease specialty and um, focuses on structural heart, cardiovascular medicine, and echocardiography. So we are very happy, thankful that you're here, Dr. Harris, to help us with this. It's very challenging, much more challenging, I think, with echo or with mitrals than tavers, it seems, and maybe just because we've been doing it longer, but it seems like it's much more challenging. So we really look forward to your presentation and um, thank you so much for your time and for your um, expertise in helping us through this. Well, yeah, thank you so much for inviting me. Um, I hope that this is a helpful presentation. Um, I'm hoping that this can be interactive. So if you have any questions along the way, feel free to unmute yourself and ask questions or um, Cheryl, if you don't mind kind of monitoring the chat box and if somebody has a question, I'm happy to stop to, to answer that. Um, I also am hopeful, I guess we'll see um, how much time it takes to get through this. Of, I had a really helpful conversation with Brittany, who is our coordinator here at the University of Michigan. Um, and you know, I, one thing that we'll kind of touch on at the end is that um, I think a partnership with the echocardiographers, especially the ones that specialize in structural heart disease, um, will be helpful because there, there were a few things that uh, became obvious in, in my conversation with Brittany that wouldn't have been you know, so clear, even though uh, Dr. Joseph and I are doing most of the structural heart echo here at the University of Michigan. Um, but yeah, with that, um, I'll get started. And thanks so much for attending today and having me present. Yes, today we'll be focusing on the mitral valve and really specifically focusing on the echo parameters. Uh, so my objectives for the presentation today will be to hopefully increase everyone's understanding of kind of the meaning of some of these um, somewhat um, kind of esoteric uh, echo terms, as well as really talking about the rationale of why they, they are collected in the TVT registry in terms of the echo-based variables. Um, the outline for the presentation today is that I do want to give a brief review of mitral valve anatomy. Hopefully that will orient everybody to some of the terms that I will be using during the presentation today. And then we'll focus on echo considerations for transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge repair first. I'll probably be mostly kind of abbreviating that as tier, um, being uh, respectful of the fact that there's multiple devices that we have available now beyond just MitraClip. Um, I am going to first focus on primary or degenerative mitral regurgitation, and then uh, go to secondary, also known as functional mitral regurgitation. And then at the end, we'll um, discuss some echo specific considerations for TMVR. So first to discuss the normal mitral valve anatomy. Um, so you can see that there is a close relationship between the mitral valve and the aortic valve. Um, can you see my pointer at all? Yes. Okay, great. Um, so you can see that the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve actually has a fibrous continuity with the aortic valve. And so in echo, um, all of the imaging that we're doing is really based on relative spatial anatomy and using um, other structures around the mitral valve to orient ourselves to what we're looking at becomes uh, very critical. And so we can use the presence of the aortic valve being anterior to the mitral valve and specifically right next to the anterior leaflet of the mitral valve to help orient ourselves. And then in terms of the mitral valve itself, it, there are two leaflets, the anterior um, labeled A1 through A3 here, and the posterior leaflet here. The posterior leaflet actually has typically three distinct scallops named P1, P2, and P3. Um, and then the anterior leaflet is named, it doesn't necessarily have those anatomic scallops, but is named based on its relationship to kind of the, that corresponding area of the posterior leaflet. So for example, there is typically a, a lateral scallop of the mitral valve called P1, and then the 
the region of the anterior leaflet that lies right next to that would be called A1. Um, and we can use some of the surrounding structures of the heart to really help to orient ourselves which portion of the mitral valve are we looking at. For example, the left atrial appendage is an anterolateral structure, so we know um, you know, the portion of the mitral valve that lies closest to that is going to be the lateral portion of the mitral valve. And the portion of the mitral valve that's medial is going to be right next to the interatrial septum. So we use these anatomic landmarks to help orient ourselves to what we're looking at at the mitral valve. Um, here's a really beautiful other kind of look at the mitral valve, which is looking at the had a beautiful complexity of the chordae tendinae and the interaction between the mitral valve leaflets, the chordae, and the papillary muscles. And the point I wanted to make here, uh, which becomes relevant when we're talking about prolapse and flail, is that um, there are actually three different types of chordae. There's the primary chordae um, that attach to the margin of the leaflet, or really kind of the, just the edge of the leaflet. And these are the ones, these primary chordae are predominantly responsible for coaptation. Um, and then there's other chordae such as this strut cord or other smaller secondary chordae that really implant into more the body of the leaflet rather than at the margin um, and do play a role in coaptation, but are play a larger role in facilitating the interaction between the mitral valve leaflet and the left ventricle, which is actually a Kind of a complex interaction. But you could see that if there was a rupture of these cords, these primary cords here, that that portion of the leaflet would no longer be supported by the chordal apparatus and you know that would allow that leaflet to become flail and go into the left atrium and I have a few examples of that. So just to um, start off with a case to highlight a patient with primary or degenerative mitral regurgitation, those um, names are oftentimes used interchangeably. <clears throat> um, so this is a 72-year-old woman with a history of metastatic malignancy, which is fortunately well controlled on chemotherapy. She's presenting with progressive dyspnea on exertion and has um, class three symptoms. Uh, she is considered to be high surgical risk based on the fact that she continues to require chemotherapy. But fortunately, her oncologic prognosis is fairly good over, over the intermediate term with a life expectancy of about five years. So we've, we thought that she was appropriate for mitral valve intervention. So um, looking at the transesophageal echo here, this is her pre-procedural echo. Um, what we're doing here is looking at something called X-plane imaging, where um, this is a view of the mitral valve called the commissural view. Um, and this allows us to see the medial to lateral aspect of the mitral valve with the left atrial appendage sitting right here. So any structure that's closer to that is going to be the lateral aspect. And then we're actually able to direct this line that goes right through the A2, P2, or the middle portion of the mitral valve and give a corresponding view here, which would be a long axis view of the mitral valve. And so in doing so, I can say with certainty that we're imaging the A2, P2 portion of this mitral valve. And that allows me to you know, determine exactly where we're looking at by a transesophageal echo. Um, and here you can see there's this prolapse of the posterior leaflet here with the associated anteriorly directed mitral regurgitation. You see that jet riding right toward the aortic valve there. Um, so this is from a 2D perspective. We use 3D, sorry, we use 3D TE um, a lot to also localize disease. Um, and uh, you can see here that this is a surgeon's uh, view or 3D rendered view of the mitral valve where this is the aortic valve at the 12 o'clock position the leaflet that's next to that is the anterior leaflet here, and then the posterior leaflet is back here at the six o'clock position with this focal prolapse. So this would be a patient that has um, anatomic disease that would be very amenable to transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge repair. So it, as an echocardiographer, you know, what are the things that I'm looking for when we're assessing a patient for the possibility of a transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge repair. 
first and foremost, you, we want to make sure that the patient has sufficient disease to kind of warrant or enough regurgitation to warrant um, intervention and you know whether they have enough that they're going to benefit from intervening on the mitral valve. And uh, secondly, and equally importantly, though, we really need to do a detailed evaluation of the anatomy of the mitral valve because uh, the anatomy plays such a large role in our success of transcatheter edge-to-edge -edge repair. So in terms of assessing mitral regurgitation severity, um, this kind of boils down to um, for patients with primary mitral regurgitation, edge-to-edge -edge repair is approved for patients with moderate to severe, which is three plus or severe four plus mitral regurgitation that have high or prohibitive surgical risk uh, with indications for mitral valve intervention. There are ongoing clinical trials that look at patients with low and intermediate surgical risk, but ultimately patients need to have three plus or more mitral regurgitation uh, to really um, benefit from transcatheter edge to edge repair. This slide is intentionally very busy. Um, so this is just kind of a visual sampling, uh, actually straight from our echocardiography guidelines of what are the parameters that we look for when we're trying to determine how severe the mitral regurgitation is. You can see, you know, this is really just a summary of some of the variables that we look for by echo. And you can see that it's actually quite a challenging um, and complex diagnosis to make in terms of grading the severity of mitral regurgitation. Um, you know, you can see that there are 15 to 20 variables that you might use. And, and really what our society guidelines recommend is that it's, it's an integrative approach. You know, for one case, you might use a certain set of variables that are trustworthy and you feel like you know, really reflect the physiology that you're seeing. In another case, you might not have those data might not be as reliable and you have to use other data to support, you know, whether a patient has mild or severe mitral regurgitation. And at the end of the day, um, it comes down to an integration of all of these kind of complex variables. And then for us to make our assessment of whether that patient has mild, moderate or severe mitral regurgitation. So to get to, you know, sometimes why the regurgitant quantification is not uh, reported, you know, sometimes it's that we truly kind of believe that somebody has severe mitral regurgitation based on many, many variables that support that, but the MR quantification would not be consistent with that. And so, you know, an echocardiographer might not report the quantitative methods if they think that it, it's not accurate. Um, so the, you know, this, the few takeaway points of our assessing mitral regurgitation severity is a comprehensive integrative approach, but when it's not crystal clear, there is a recommendation to perform quantitative evaluation of actually measuring how much regurgitant blood flow there is. Um, and this is due uh, through a few different variables that we'll report, which you've probably seen, which um, is effective regurgitant orifice area, EROA. Um, that, if you think about it, is kind of like, what is the size of the hole that's causing the leakiness of, of the mitral valve? And if somebody has 0.4 centimeters squared or above, that would be consistent with severe 0.3 to 0.39 would be consistent with moderate to severe. Um, and then other variables that uh, are derived from this are the regurgitant volume. So actually, you know, an estimate of how much backwards blood flow there is with greater than 60 being considered severe or 45 to 59 mils being consistent with moderate to severe. And then we can also look at the regurgitant fraction, which is a comparison of how much backwards blood flow there is to the total uh, stroke volume from the left ventricle with greater than 50% being severe. So these are when quantification is able to be accurately reported, this is how the numbers um, reflect the severity of mitral regurgitation. But you can see that it can get quite complex.
So not everybody with severe primary mitral regurgitation really needs um, valve intervention at that moment in time um, because severe primary mitral regurgitation can be tolerated for long periods of time by, by some patients. And so other things that we're looking for in addition to looking at the severity of the mitral regurgitation by echo is to look for um, a couple of variables that are important for determining the need for intervention with looking at the left ventricular function. So an EF of less than 60% would be considered uh, that there would be LV dysfunction in the setting of severe MR. And that um, has an indication for mitral valve intervention, as well as progressive left ventricular dilation. Um, so looking at various uh, parameters that determine you know, how large the left ventricle uh, is important um, because people with larger left ventricles have you know, worse prognosis, so intervention earlier is better. But you know, oftentimes this is really driven by a patient having symptoms prior to meeting you know, some of these echocardiography indications for mitral valve intervention. So to get to you know, some of the specific variables that you'll see uh, reported on echo reports, um, so here is a parasternal long axis view of the left ventricle. Uh, from this view, we can measure the dimension of the left ventricle, which is done at end diastole shown here. Um, you'll see this reported as either the LV end diastolic di diameter or the internal diastolic diameter. Those are interchangeable terms. For this patient that I discussed at the beginning, her LV EDD was 5.4 centimeters. And that same corresponding measurement at end systole when the left ventricle is its smallest was 3.8 centimeters. Um, we can also look at, instead of just measuring a single dimension, we can look at um, estimating the volume of the left ventricle. This can be done through um, measuring via the Simpsons method, which you can see that we, when we have sufficient image quality, we can trace along the endocardial border at end diastole when it's at its largest and end systole in both the apical four chamber and apical two chamber views. And um, through a you know, mathematical formula that can allow us to get um, the end diastolic volume and the end systolic volume. And using the fraction of those, we can get the left ventricular ejection fraction or EF. Um, so you can see that there are a couple methods for assessing volume. So that's through the Simpsons method here. I've also shown an example of how um, the volumes can be assessed by 3D echo. So here you can see we're using 3D reconstruction to assess the end diastolic volume and, and systolic volume. So these two methods would be used uh, when, when we're reporting the actual LV volumes. You can see that these three different methods are probably the methods that you'll see for um, assessing ejection fraction with the visual ejection fraction probably being a fairly common uh, method of reporting that you'll see. Um, and this is oftentimes needed when we really don't have the image quality to be able to perform an accurate Simpsons method or accurate 3D quantification of function. And so when you see lots of visual reporting, that oftentimes is due to um, you know, just not having the image quality to be able to make these more uh, precise measurements. And when a visual EF is reported, we don't measure the LV volumes in that situation. So that would be a reason why those would be omitted from an echo report. Um, left atrial volume is another variable that's collected. For people that have chronic mitral regurgitation that's significant, we expect there to be remodeling of both the left ventricle and the left atrium due to this volume overload effect. So we typically will see that you'll get left atrial dilation with chronic mitral regurgitation. And this is that same patient that had a moderately dilated left atrium. You know, this is again by tracing um, kind of the endocardial border of the left atrium from a four chamber and two chamber view. And her atrial volume was 68 mils, which indexed to body surface area comes out to be 
about 41 mils per meter squared, which is consistent with a moderately dilated left atrium. Um, so in terms of the quantification of mitral regurgitation itself, there are really three methods that can be used to truly provide a number for MR quantification. You'll probably see that the most commonly used method is called the PISA method, shown here in the center. This stands for proximal isovelocity surface area, which you probably don't need to remember that term. Um, but to kind of, and the, the derivation of this is kind of beyond the scope of this presentation. But essentially what we're doing with this method is trying to, in, in ECHO, we're not able to measure the actual size of the hole of the, um, that's causing the mitral regurgitation. So we have to look at indirect measures of that. And so in this method, we look at the flow rate of blood flow as it's approaching that hole. Um, and we can, um, we can use echo variables to be able to actually calculate the effective regurgitant orifice area. Um, but it's important to note that there can be you know, important pitfalls of this method. And it assumes that there's a circular hole to the mitral valve, which does not always apply. And that can be a reason that it can either be an overestimate or underestimate of the true uh, regurgitant severity. Another method that I really like to use, especially for functional mitral regurgitation, is shown on the right here, which is the 3D vena contracta area. So um, we do this using 3D echo. Um, and uh, commonly by transesophageal echo, just because it has better image quality. Um, and you can see that we're doing a reconstruction of the mitral regurgitation jet itself. And we try to find the narrowest portion called the vena contracta and can actually measure the cross section of that. Um, and that uh, reflects the regurgitant orifice area um, at the vena contracta. Um, so this would be another type of measurement that can be made for mitral regurgitation. Um, and then what I've shown on the left, uh, we don't use this as commonly here, but you may see this elsewhere, um, is uh, using quantitative Doppler. So if you know, if you can estimate the amount of total blood volume that's pushed out by the left ventricle, that some of that is going forward as expected through the aortic valve. And if you can measure what's going through the aortic valve and what's in total being pushed out of the left ventricle, then you can estimate what is not going in the right direction. So what's the regurgitant flow going through the mitral valve? And so all three of these methods um, are reasonable methods to use. And it's really up to the echocardiographer to be aware of you know, which data can be trusted and you know, what are some of the common pitfalls um, because it can be, you know, a complex um, assessment to do. Okay, so that's kind of the mitral regurgitation assessment. Then when we've confirmed that, yes, this patient has significant mitral regurgitation warranting intervention, then the fun really begins in terms of, is this patient a candidate for an edge-to-edge -edge repair approach? Um, and so many of the patients that we see for primary MR are going to be prolapse and flail. Um, and here are a couple examples of patients that have each of these type of etiologies of their valve disease. Um, here you can see, I've, I've done a freeze frame of this moving image where you see this posterior leaflet of the mitral valve um, going up into the left atrium. I've kind of drawn a line here of what's the plane of the mitral annulus and you can see the body of that leaflet raising up into the left atrium, and that, that's consistent with posterior leaflet prolapse there. And in the color image, you see, again, this really eccentric anteriorly directed jet that you'd expect with posterior prolapse. Um, similar, but a little bit different by echo is this concept of flail, where instead, of, you see how um, the margin or kind of end of this posterior leaflet is still pointing toward the left ventricle. In this case, you can see that the leaflet is kind of free in terms of the mobility of the tip of the leaflet. 
And when I freeze it in systole, you actually see this ruptured cord here and the end of the posterior leaflet actually pointing up into the left atrium. And so that would be an example of a, a flail posterior leaflet. Um, beyond that, you know, once we've recognized something as prolapse or flail, there is um, additional kind of localization to understand what, where the involvement and what's the extent of the involvement, because that has a lot of relevance um, from an edge-to-edge -edge repair approach. This, um, you know, some of the anatomic complexity doesn't necessarily make it into the TVT registry in terms of you know, the exact localization and things like that, but just to kind of give you a flavor of a few different things that we would see. So this is a posterior flail from a surgeon's view. Um, we see that the lateral or P1 aspect of the uh, posterior leaflet, you can see that flail segment right there, which corresponds with this 2D image here. Um, here is an example of anterior leaflet prolapse, where you can see this is the leaflet that's right next to the aortic valve, and you see this leaflet rising up into the left atrium, and you can see that there's this posteriorly directed mitral regurgitation jet. So both of these um, are would be fairly amenable to an edge-to-edge -edge repair approach because it's fairly focal disease. Uh, what becomes more challenging is when you have more diffuse involvement, as you can see in bioleaflet prolapse. And here's a surgeon's view where you can see really both the anterior and posterior leaflet are rising up into the left atrium. Um, and you can also see there's a uh, diffuse thickening of those leaflets. So the other term that you'll see for this would be called Barlow's disease. Um, so that would be consistent with this kind of diffuse bioleaflet prolapse. Okay, other variables that you'll see that are very relevant to edge to edge repair are that, um, so the end goal is to put in a device that's going to um, close off the mitral regurgitation. And you've, you've probably seen this where um, we're typically placing a device in the middle of the valve resulting in a double orifice valve during diastole where you have this lateral and medial orifice. That means that the entire mitral valve area has been decreased by putting in this device. And so we really want to make sure that when we decrease the mitral valve area, that we're not going to cause a patient to have significant mitral stenosis. And so um, probably one of the best ways we have to assess for that is what is their mitral valve area going into it? Um, and this can most uh, accurately be done through 3D, um, usually TEE where we can make a reconstruction uh, going right through the, the tips of the leaflets and then actually measuring the area of, of the orifice there. Um, so this patient had a, a nice size mitral valve area of 8.6 centimeters squared, which would be you know, low risk for causing stenosis. Um, the other thing we look for are gradients pre-procedurally. Um, certainly patients that already have elevated gradients, we'd, concern, we'd be concerned that those gradients are gonna be higher. <clears throat> Um, and these gradients are, are measured um, using Doppler, uh, where we can look at the velocity of blood flow along this path that I'm showing here. Um, in addition to what I've shown, we also assess for other conditions that really would kind of preclude a patient from being able to get a successful edge-to-edge -edge repair. So shown here are a couple examples of that. Uh, so this is a patient that had, had rheumatic, also known as post-inflammatory mitral valve disease. You can see kind of the characteristic fusion of the commissures here, this uh, rheumatic nodule uh, on 3D. And then on 2D, you can see that the leaflets are very restricted in terms of the motion. Um, and there is significant mitral regurgitation, but this would not be a valve that could be successfully treated with edge-to-edge -edge repair. Um, and likewise, we're seeing a lot more of this, which is um, calcific mitral valve disease, which can cause either stenosis or regurgitation. In this case, uh, the patient had predominantly regurgitation, and that's really secondary to this calcium buildup on the posterior leaflet, causing a restriction of that motion. And then you get this um, very eccentric regurgitation in this 
for this patient. We have one question. Oh, um, yeah. And about the inflammatory, would you consider COVID as a post-inflammatory? Inflammatory? Um, that's a good question. I, I think it really comes down to what kind of anatomy are you seeing? Um, you know, I, I certainly it's, we, I haven't personally seen a lot of this, but I could imagine that, you know, patients could have a post-inflammatory condition, but it kind of comes down to a description of the mitral valve anatomy of are the leaflets thickened? Are they restricted in terms of their motion? Um, you know, certainly a lot of patients with COVID have kind of the usual mitral valve disease that we see in other populations, you know, prolapse, flail, functional MR. And so I think it really comes down to the description of, of the anatomy that you're seeing rather than just kind of the clinical history there. Does that kind of answer that question? Yes, thank you. Okay. Um, there is a specific um, line in the TVT form uh, to answer about annular calcification as well as leaflet calcification. Um, so annular calcification can um, it is actually pretty prevalent in our older population of patients. And usually, as long as it's not bulky and severe, um, usually does not preclude somebody from an edge-to-edge -edge repair approach. It may make it a little bit more challenging. Where we get more concerned is when the calcium actually starts to encroach on the leaflets themselves. Um, one, because it can reduce the leaflet motion and increase the risk of mitral stenosis, but also um, the presence of calcium can prevent the device from being able to really grasp onto the leaflet appropriately. So this was a, a TE that I recently did where the question was really, you know, how much of the leaflet is involved here? And you can see both the annular calcium as well as a little bit of leaflet calcium, but we felt that um, there's enough mobile posterior leaflet that it's still doable, um, but the TVT is you know, cl collecting this because um, these patients are maybe less favorable doesn't mean that they're not candidates, but does increase the risk of, of you know, residual MR or gradients. Can so I ask just, a question there? Yes, please. Does mm -hmm. the calcium also increase the risk of stroke there on the leaflets? Um, I don't know if I've necessarily seen data behind that. I think it, it would make intuitive sense that yes, there might be, um, at least slightly higher risks of stroke. Um, it, I guess the one thing I would say though is that typically the calcium is, in most of the cases that we're considering for edge-to-edge -edge repair, is not one of these like highly mobile types of calcium that you can see with maybe more advanced calcification. And so when it's smaller and sessile, I would have lower concern for that embolizing but you know, I'm, I'm not aware of if there's kind of data behind that. Okay, thank you. Um, so just to kind of wrap up the primary mitral regurgitation section. Um, so this is the patient that I discussed at the very beginning that had that isolated P2 prolapse. Um, she ended up getting a single mitral clip device placed at the A2 P2 portion of her valve um, and had a reduction in her um, mitral regurgitation to mild. Here's her post-operative transthoracic echo where you can see this, this is the mitral clip right here. And then here's the color where you see, you know, just a little bit of mitral regurgitation arising next to that um, clip there. And she had a, an acceptable gradient of four um, on her surface echo. And in follow-up, she's now been followed out to a year and she's feeling better with, with definitely better uh, symptoms in terms of her shortness of breath. So, um, oh, sorry, one, a uh, couple more slides and then I'll pause for questions again. Um, <clears throat> so to get into kind of the post-procedural assessment of uh, tear and residual mitral regurgitation, this is actually a, a highly kind of complex um, subject and there's even, you know, individual guidelines that have been devoted to how do we accurately assess 
mitral regurgitation after a tear approach. Um, it, it's complex. There's not a single right answer here other than I know that one of the variables is whether um, a PISA has been used to quantify. And it's actually typically not recommended to use the PISA method post tier uh, because the usual geometric assumptions that we make when we're using the PISA, PISA method don't actually apply for this as compared to people that just have native mitral regurgitation. So that, that's another reason that you'll frequently see the PISA not reported or a quantification not per performed after edge to edge repair because many of the methods that we use are actually not recommended to be used. Um, and then just a quick word on, you know, why, why is it important to look at mitral regurgitation and gradients? So here's um, a study that looked at the prognostic significance of higher degrees of mitral regurgitation as well as higher gradients. Um, and you can see that patients that had um, moderate or severe in the orange and purple lines here, degrees of regurgitation had worse outcomes, more heart failure ho hospitalizations, uh, higher risk of death. Um, and likewise, um, when they were dichotomized into lower versus higher gradients, I, you know, the 4.4 millimeters of mercury isn't necessarily the magic number, but it's just to show that people that had higher gradients for primary MR treated with tear um, did have you know, worse outcomes than those with low gradients. Um, so certainly, you know, trying to optimize outcomes from a regurgitation and gradient perspective is very important. Okay, uh, with that, I wanted to pause for questions. The next two sections are, are shorter, so feel free to ask some questions about the, the primary MR. So I guess I'll ask a question. Um, you, you said it's technically challenging and, and there's a lot of standardization around mitral regurg post-procedure, yet you said there's worse outcomes with, so how do you, how do you, I don't know, measure yeah, that? Yeah, I go think forward it, with that? It, it becomes challenging, you know, especially when, you know, a lot of the data that you'll see are based on individual core labs from um, you know, clinical trials that have assessed this and they have their own methods of, of assessing. And I think as we try to branch this out to you know, individual centers, there is a lot of variability that you'll see in grading regurgitation after tier. Some of that is you know, differences in comfort level, but honestly, there, it does come down to it's complex. There's not a single right answer um, it's, it kind of falls back to our usual echo tenants, which are that there's not one single data point that is the right answer. And you have to kind of bring the, you know, the whole wealth of information that you get from the echo to, you know, make your assessment there. But yeah, it, it's, you know, it's certainly an issue. Um, you know, people are investigating other methods such as cardiac MRI, but, you know, Echo really still is kind of the workhorse when it comes to assessing after after tier. <clears throat> yeah, it, it just makes me think about the reliability of our data and what we can get from it from our reports. You know, that just makes yeah. me. What? Yeah, I think it's a, a fair point. I, I think it also kind of speaks to the fact that you know having kind of engaged um, echocardiographers that have more interest and experience with, with this um, could probably help to, to make the, the data kind of more reproducible. Um, you know, because like I said, at our institution, we have 20 plus echo readers and everybody has their own opinion about, you know, whether that mitral regurgitation after clip is moderate versus severe versus mild. Yeah, I, I think one of our goals um, is to get the echo um, physicians involved more in our MISHIC meetings with micro procedures. So um, I think we were, we're working on that for the fall. So yeah, nice. Yeah. All right. That's Thank great. you. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. So um, moving on to functional or secondary mitral regurgitation. Here's a gentleman that we recently saw in our program, a 75 year old man with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, 
treated with um, you know, maximally tolerated medical therapy as well as cardiac resynchronization therapy. And he was presenting with worsening shortness of breath and severe mitral regurgitation. Here you can see that he has kind of a globally reduced ejection fraction, but does have you know, some wall motion abnormalities consistent with his ischemic cardiomyopathy. And then you can see here that he actually has a pretty normally looking anterior leaflet, but the posterior leaflet is, is not moving normally in systole and is really kind of being tethered down where you see it uh, pointing toward the apex of the heart instead of being able to come up and co-opt with the anterior leaflet. And then you see this posteriorly directed mitral regurgitation that would be consistent with, all of this is consistent with functional mitral regurgitation. So in terms of uh, you know, how this is reflected in the TVT, it's kind of broken down into which leaflets are involved. Um, so this, which I just showed is an example of really just predominant posterior leaflet tethering, which is the most common form of uh, functional mitral regurgitation. But you will see by leaflet tethering, you can see here, you know, both leaflets are pulled down below the level of the annular plane. Um, and this is commonly seen for you know, more severely dilated or non-ischemic uh, cardiomyopathies that, that you see this. But a, a newer uh, kind of kit on the block is this recognition that people can also have functional MR due to just isolated annular dilation. So this is actually a patient of mine who has normal LV function, but has a severely dilated left atrium. And you can see that the leaflet motion is actually normal, but the, what causes the mitral regurgitation is that the leaflets are just physically being pulled apart, creating that gap in coaptation. Um, so really all three of these um, can be mechanisms and there's increasing recognition of this new, um, not really new, but newly recognized condition of atrial functional mitral regurgitation. Um, Brittany and I have talked about this concept of restriction versus tethering um, because the TVT kind of makes a, a distinction there. I think this is tricky because it kind of comes down just to terminology here. And some of the, the difficulty with this is that um, this is a, a fairly classic um, classification system that's used to determine mitral regurgitation severity as developed by a French surgeon named uh, Dr. Carpentier. And so he, for patients that have um, restricted leaflet motion um, as compared to normal or excessive leaflet motion, not shown here, are um, that he broke it down into either this kind of type A, which is shown here more consistent with this inflammatory, post-inflammatory rheumatic appearance where the leaflets are thickened, uh, restricted in both systole and diastole, but also kind of described this functional MR as restricted leaflet motion. Um, at our institution, we've tried to make a distinction between these because you know, these are clearly different pathologies and clearly need to be treated differently. So we've tried to really make a distinction that this is restricted leaflet motion and that the more functional um, type is tethering of the posterior leaflet or some people refer to cordal tethering. I think this is where it kind of just comes down to terminology and maybe you know coming working with your echocardiographers to come up with a consistent way of reporting this um, because you know it, both terms are probably appropriate, but as long as you can kind of know what your echo doc is thinking is probably the most important thing. Um, just a brief word on MR quantification and secondary mitral regurgitation. So um, I mentioned at the beginning that the PISA method, which is our most common form of quantification of MR, um, assumes that the hole that is in the mitral valve is a circular hole. This assumption really falls apart in secondary or functional mitral regurgitation. This is a pretty classic patient that if we look at um, that being a contracted area, which is the hole in the mitral valve, and zoom in on it, this is what we see here, which is clearly not a circle. It's very elliptical in shape. And um, in this case, the PISA method can underestimate mitral regurgitation severity. 
And so if image quality is sufficient and you know people are comfortable and trained in this, this can be a place where vena contracta area, I think can be really helpful for um, improving accuracy of MR grading here. And this was a patient that there was a clear discrepancy of the vena contracta area and PISA method. Um, and you know this was clearly very severe mitral regurgitation for this patient. Um, so <clears throat> to follow up, um, this is the patient I discussed um, with worsening shortness of breath. He ended up getting two clips placed to the A2P2 position. You can see that he has um, mild residual MR seen here, just a very small jet adjacent to that device there, and has an acceptable gradient, uh, mean gradient of three. Um, and he had, uh, he's been followed out to 30 days at this point has had just mild improvement of his shortness of breath, um, but was pretty deconditioned beforehand and is starting cardiac rehab. So we're hopeful between the mitral valve intervention and him being able to be a little bit more active, he'll, he'll be feeling better soon. Um, I, just to kind of go back to what I had presented for the degenerative MR, um, again, these are um, post hoc analyses of the COAP trial, which included only patients with functional MR undergoing, who are randomized to either medical therapy or mitroclip plus medical therapy. And you can see again that residual mitral regurgitation has a big impact on outcomes. Um, so shown here in green are those patients with no or one plus mild mitral regurgitation. Those patients that were left with moderate to severe or more MR had much worse outcomes in terms of hospitalization or or death. Um, and it does appear that there might be a signal for patients with moderate MR also not doing quite as well as those with mild or less. What's interesting though, when they looked at mitral valve gradients, it seemed to be less important for this functional MR group. I, I think you know there still needs to be more data from this standpoint, but if you look at patients with the highest gradients, the highest quartile of gradients with a mean gradient of seven on average, um, there was actually no difference in outcome. So suggest that maybe in this group, and again, we need more data, but it favors, you know, really trying to address the MR and, uh, you know, um, tolerating slightly higher gradients. Um, questions before I move on to TMVR? We have about eight minutes, so maybe we should. Okay. Yeah. Sounds good. So, um, echo is um, certainly important in the assessment prior to TMVR, but um, it it is a very complex um, procedural planning, especially when we are thinking about um, placing a circular valve, such as the balloon expandable valves created for TAVR into non-circular orifices. Um, so for example, in valve and ring and valve and MAC. And so th this is where um, there's a really important emphasis on CT planning, which I won't go into because uh, that's way beyond the scope of presentation today. So I'll focus on echo, but just to know that, you know, there, there is a lot of complexity in the planning for TMVR. Most frequently we're doing valve and valve, uh, which is relatively, straightforward um, CT planning is still helpful, but echo um, measurements can be quite helpful. So in terms of what we're doing from an echo assessment, you know, certainly we're trying to uh, determine the etiology of the valve dysfunction. This was an example of somebody with a flail prosthetic leaflet that clearly had severe prosthetic regurgitation. Another really important feature that we're doing by echo is to look for paravalvular regurgitation. Um, by putting in a transcatheter mitral valve, we're not addressing the paravalvular leak. And so knowing that ahead of time is important in terms of either planning to do a paravalvular occluder device, or you know, potentially that patient would be better served with surgery. Um, a, a unique um, challenge that is posed by TMVR is this concept of LVOT obstruction. Um, so this is a nice diagram that demonstrates this, where this is the left ventricular outflow track. Um, and when you put this TMVR valve in, you can see that you're actually propping this anterior leaflet open. 
and encroaching on the outflow tract. This can be a really big problem for valve and MAC and other um, situations where the anterior leaflet is still present, such as valve and ring. It's less of an issue for valve and valve, but still, you know, there, that risk still exists. And so this is, again, where CT becomes very uh, helpful in kind of predicting that risk. There are certain echo variables that can be used, but um, with kind of less accuracy than, than CT. So yet another plug for how CT can kind of trump echo from that standpoint. Um, from a post-TMVR echo assessment, you know, the things that are really important to look for are the function of the valve. So, you know, what did the valve gradients look like? This is somebody who has, uh, just after valve deployment, the leaflets are opening normally, they look normal, has a nice normal mean gradient of four, no paravalvular regurgitation seen by 2D or 3D echo. And then um, in speaking to that risk for LVOT obstruction, we also use um, Doppler echo to look for gradients across the left ventricular outflow tract. Um, and this patient really had no evidence of that. So that's why you'll see um, the LVOT velocity reported for TMVR. Um, it's, it's a very important thing. Um, it is associated with, with poor outcomes if we cause obstruction. Um, so we really try to avoid it at all costs. Um, the last echo variable that I'll share with you is the mitral valve area, which is really the effective orifice area. Um, and we can assess the effective orifice area of the mitral prosthesis using the continuity equation, which is kind of similar to what we use on the aortic side, where we look for the, the stroke volume through the um, left ventricular outflow tract. So LVOT area times LVOT VTI, and then divide it by the VTI of the, uh, of the flow going through your mitral prosthesis. And for this patient, we got an EOA, which you can think of as the mitral valve area of 1.4 centimeters squared. Okay, so um, to conclude, I hope that I've kind of shown you the relevance of echo, especially for um, edge to edge repair. I think echo is really the dominant form of imaging for assessing uh, the regurgitation severity, but also to be able to identify appropriate anatomy and make sure the patients aren't going to develop significant stenosis post -tier. Um, the, the assessment after edge-to-edge -edge repair is complex in terms of residual MR, but both MR and gradients are very important in terms of long-term outcomes. And then for TMVR, echo and CT really play a complementary role and post-TMVR assessing MR gradients, as well as um, uniquely in this case, LVOT gradients are very important. Okay, so with that, I wanted to open it up to questions again. Any questions from our coordinators? So I, I guess I have a question. Um, I've been in the lab watching them do the clips and there's, um, is there a point where it's like, um, can you put another clip or will that make the gradient too high in the long run? And you, they discuss it back and forth, it seems like. Yeah, yeah. I think that <clears throat> you've identified one of the, the challenges of, of this technology are that once you deploy it, you can't recapture it. And so, you know, oftentimes what happens is after, say you have severe regurgitation that's involving a large portion of the leaflet, you place a single device and you're not happy with the result. And the question is, is that because you, we really just need more than one device or is it that we're not happy with that the first device is actually doing what we want it to? And, and the question is, well, if we put a second device, are we going to ultimately be happy or do we need to kind of optimize the first device? Um, so that, yes, gets into the challenges that we have with edge to edge repair. Okay, so I, I guess I guess if you had to pick one, you pick 
low gradients over, is, is that true? An acceptable um, gradient over acceptable MR? Or is that- So, so I think what, what I think really is probably most important in terms of getting optimal outcomes is making sure we're selecting the right patients to start off. Um, because there are ranges of complexity to patients, you know, especially for centers that are getting started off. I think starting with kind of optimal valve anatomy where we expect them to have um, good outcomes is, is probably a good way to get started. And those are people with kind of isolated prolapse or flail or kind of non-complex functional MR. Um, and then, you know, for experience centers, where you know there's you know the wealth of experience then you know you might take on some additional challenges in terms of hey we know this is going to be a tough case um but you know you kind of know that going into it and you've you've talked with the patient about what the options are surgery trials um and kind of go in eyes wide open and that's where you know the pre-procedural echo i think is critical in terms of really having a, a very defined sense of what the anatomy is. Well, and to, sorry, to answer your question, both, like we care about both. And, right. and so the problem is that there's not kind of a clear trade-off. Um, you know, you really want to be able to get low amounts of regurgitate, eliminate it without causing a gradient. And the patients where you have that trade-off is oftentimes a patient that's more complex anatomically from the very beginning. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. Um, thank you so much for your time. It's, it's three o'clock and I don't want to um, go over for anybody. Um, this is recorded, so we'll be able to watch it over and over because there's a lot of information here that we can, we can look at. And um, we are um, offering CMEs for this for our coordinators that want to use this. And thank you so much, Dr. Harris. Um, I appreciate it very much. We all have um, really requested this mitral um, overview. So it's really great. It's really in depth and we're really valuable. So thank you.